Let me, uh, let me begin today by uh, giving a few simple observations that probably seem uh, very, very simple, but uh, there, were, uh, there were no newspaper reporters walking around Jesus, in Jesus' day putting down stories about Jesus on paper. Uh, there were no digital cameras capturing his image. There were uh, no Twitter record recording the raw reactions to him as things were going on. No video to capture his voice capture the way he uh, interacted with people, and certainly no such thing as live stream. Uh, the earliest records we have, the earliest gospel accounts were written about 40 years after the time of Jesus. At about 70 AD is when they believe the gospel of Mark was recorded. But uh, it's certainly, as you read it, and certainly as you read the other, other gospels, they, it certainly indicates that they indeed were still in touch with Jesus, what he said and did. And uh, it certainly records how the people experienced him. Uh, so th today, one of the things we want to glimpse at is how the uh, earliest followers experienced him or wrote down uh, that they experienced him as a catalyst for healing, a catalyst for healing. And uh, to get you thinking today, I want you just to imagine you're from another country and you, are, you speak English, you can read English, you're brought uh, to... Uh, to, uh, to, to the D.C. area with no other information. You have no smartphone. You, they, someone sticks you on the metro train, and there's no other, pe no other person on the metro train. You have the metro map, and you start to scan it. And so just to think about that. If anyone who's ever been on the metro, you would start, start to look at the, stop, the names of the stops on the map. You would look at uh, things like Union Station. Should I go there? And, and the, the key thing to say is you have, uh, you have some sort of medical condition that you need help. So uh, you look at Union Station. Well, that made, that made who knows what that'll do for you. Vienna, Huntington, Farragut North, Shady Grove. You rattle through the list. But uh, this one stop medical center sounds like that might be a, a good place to get to. So you figure out how to get to medical center. Take a gamble, but if you went there from a foreign country with an illness, do you think you would find a few things that might help you there? Two hospitals, a, uh, a school, for a medical school there, countless offices there dealing with medicine, and certainly the National Institute of Health is there. That is the stop when I stereotype, where, where would you go? I think about medical center would be the stop I would recommend someone go to. If you were uh, in Israel, there are many spots that remember key events in Jesus' life. Uh, the feeding of the 5,000, there's a, a place to remember that event. The praying in Gethsemane, there's a spot to remember that. The crucifixion, Jesus' baptism, there's places where we remember those events. If there was a center of health stop in Israel, it would have been in, uh, in the northern part of Israel in the town of Capernaum. There's little doubt about that. Uh, this is kind of a, an aerial view of, a modern day view of the aerial view of Capernaum. And uh, it's the north part of the Sea of Galilee. If you think of the Sea of Galilee as a clock, Capernaum is essentially 1130 or 12 o'clock. It's right on the sea. Uh, this, uh, during its day, would have been a fairly large town. 1,500 to 2,000 people would have been a large town. It was along a major trade route. Roman soldiers were stationed here. There was a Roman tax office there. There was a synagogue there. And if you're looking over at this one, uh, this is the synagogue. Okay, This area right here is called an insula, which is basically uh, multiple rooms where uh, someone would have had a sleeping room there and a common, common room. What's interesting here, and there are certainly more here, but this is today. This, uh, what shape is that? So octagon, so if anyone looks around, you might recognize an octagon somewhere. But uh, this is a Roman Catholic church today. Um, but underneath that, uh, the floor of that church, what's really cool is you can see down below, it's clear. You can see another octagon, which was an early Christian church. And uh, the, uh, what's interesting about an octagon is uh, in, in the, in the uh, Christians in the Greco-Roman rule world, Num the number seven represented completion, in the sense the seven days of creation, the, uh, s the uh, seven days in a week. Number eight, in a sense, represented beyond complete. When we talk about the eighth day, as, e as in Easter Sunday, the day of resurrection, 
we're talking about how God, God's perfection. Uh, so they, in their architecture, used an octagon, used an octagon. But what's interesting is the, uh, the church, churches in Israel were usually built over significant spots. Who do you, where do you think, what do you think this was built over top of? It would have been built over the uh, home of Peter, the home of Peter. So Peter, Peter, his wife, his brother Andrew, his mother-in-law, uh, and they certainly believe that that was the spot where Jesus would have stayed when he was in Capernaum, when he moved to Capernaum. Um, Capernaum means Nahum's town, and that doesn't mean much, but when you look up the, what the meaning of Nahum is, Nahum means comforter. If you will, Jesus lived in the town of the comforter. And in the first century, people began flocking to this place to experience Jesus, the healer and the comforter. They began to come there for comfort, support, and help. There's more cases of Jesus' healings being documented here in Capernaum than anywhere else. It was like this was the hub of where people flocked to. Lepers flocked there, people with fever, paralysis, if you had a bad back, the whole kind, a whole host of conditions labeled as unclean spirits, those people came to Capernaum, to this fishing village. They wanted to, to get near Jesus. What you have to remember, and this is the first century worldview, illness, and uh, all sorts of uh, the, the conditions I just mentioned were, uh, were seen as conditions of disfavor, that God disapproving of someone in some way. And what would happen is if someone had a condition like that, you would often steer clear of them for fear that their disfavor would be contagious, that it would rub off on you. So in a sense, unfortunately, in some ways, if you had an Ill illness or a malady or an unclean spirit, you were pretty much on your own. It was just their worldview. The good news, though, is, uh, and let me be very, very, very clear, is that in his day, Jesus didn't buy into that worldview. He didn't buy into that worldview in that generation, nor does he buy into it in every generation. He didn't see illness as disfavor. He saw illness as an opportunity to, to demonstrate love and care to, to people who weren't completely whole. And what, what, we, what we, is very, very clear is he wasn't afraid to get involved. He wasn't afraid to talk to people. He wasn't afraid to put his arm around people, to touch them, to hug them, to demonstrate acceptance and compassion. A lot of other people were afraid to do that, but Jesus was always breaking the barriers and being willing to do that. What we have to remember is Jesus wasn't a genie. We, a lot of people would love him to be a genie and grant them three wishes. A lot of us, would. Do, I probably would like him to do that too. But uh, what, what's clear is Jesus as a healer, was clearly in tune with the needs of others. He understood people's needs, and he clearly wanted them to know that I am holding your hand. I am with you on this journey. I will go with you with whatever you go through. I will go through it with you. I often use the phrase catalyst when I think of Jesus' healing ministry. A, a catalyst is an agent who provokes or speeds significant change. And the Gospels, when they talk about Jesus as healer, often use the word uh, dunamis, dunamis, which means power, which means power. And, and it, what, what it shows over and over is Jesus wanted to share his power with other people by his words, by his touch, by giving others authority to be his agents of healing in this world. In a sense, we can picture uh, a jumper cables. Think about another car that's utter, the battery is utterly drained, Jesus' battery is always full, and he wanted to share that power with other people along the way. Yeah, significant change, though, looks different, and I think that's what, cha what is really, really challenging in this life. Uh, it's challenging as a pastor when you recognize at times uh, significant change, and being fully recharged for someone means they are utterly released from their illness or their addiction. They are, it's a complete outer renewal. In other cases, illness may still be there. The cancer may still be there. And it, on the surface, it looks like there's absolutely no change at all. But God's healing sometimes works in, in strange ways. I've talked to so many people who, who on the surface, their uh, illness has not disappeared. But inwardly, as you talk to them, you realize they feel so drawn to the Lord. They feel that God is so powerfully with them, it's utterly 
amazing. You know, I, I, and they're, they're the ones who testify. I know everything is going to be all right. I mean, I remember not too long ago, right before my dad's uh, heart bypass, he basically said to us, you know, no matter what happens in surgery tomorrow, just know everything's going to be fine. Uh, in every case, healing is a process. It's not a, you know, it's not just a magical uh, click your fingers. It's a process where most of the time God surrounds someone with uh, people, with treatment, with helpers along the way, so that a new chapter, a new witness can emerge from that story. And uh, the image in the gospel today is incredibly important for all of us. It's about a man paralyzed. And whether it's physically paralyzed or paralyzed in some sort of emotional or spiritual way, I'll let you be the judge of that. But the key is, this is a man who's in great need, and he really can't do much on his own. He needs the help of others. And four people notice his need, and they insist that he matters so much to them and so much to God that his requests have to be put in front of Jesus. And so what they do is they go, there's a crowd around this this home, and what they do is they, they can't get in, so they literally climb up and rip the roof off the top of the house. Their actions show that they, too, understand that they are agents of healing and care. They are people who notice, they persist, it's a bit creative in how they go about it, they show they're uh, compassionate, they show they're willing to go the extra mile, they'll do what it takes to make that person's needs known to Jesus and to God himself. In our day and age, we need people who rip the roof off to help others, to help them on their path of healing. And uh, one of the things we, in sort of lifting up people like Liz, is you recognize that in this parish in daily life, we have people who are trying to rip the roof off by uh, being doctors and nurses and researchers, trying to figure out all the best treatment that can be offered in this day and age. We have counselors in our midst. We have Stephen ministers. We have people who simply see part of their daily life. Their role is to listen to another person. We know that listening is often the, the greatest gift we can offer to another person. We have people who uh, go out of their way to give hugs where hugs are desperately needed. And finally, we rip the roof off all of us when we persist in prayer. When we continually voice before God our needs and the needs of others and tell God about the precious people in our lives who need care. As the Gospels certainly testify, when we bring people's needs before God, He indeed does care, He notices, and He will always get involved. Amen.